allow me to welcome you to this, this virtual briefing of the Pan American Health Organization, the regional office of the Americas of the World Health Organization. This briefing is a part of an ongoing dialogue with press that we've had over the past several weeks. Today, the director of PAHO, Dr. Chris Etienne, will brief you about the current situation of COVID-19 in the region of the Americas, what the countries are doing, and how PAHO is working with them. Dr. Chen will give a media briefing on COVID-19 every Tuesday, and you are invited to connect to these sessions. She is joined today by Dr. Jarbas Barbosa, the Assistant Director of PAHO and one of the organization's spokespersons. She's also joined by Dr. Ciro Ugarte, who is the Director of the Emergencies Program in PAHO, as well as Dr. Marcos Espinal, Director of Communicable Diseases at PAHO, and the organization's second spokesperson. She is also joined by Dr. Silva Aldigeri, Deputy Director of the organization's emergency, emergency Department and Incident Manager for the COVID-19 pandemic. Following Dr. Etienne's comments, she will open the floor to questions. We will start with questions that have been submitted, submitted over the past two days, and then we will move to questions that are available to be proposed through the chat session as a part of this process. Allow me to note that this, this session is being transmitted through PAHO's Facebook and Twitter accounts. A recording will be available after the briefing and shared with those connected. With no further ado, allow me to pass the microphone to Dr. Carissa Etienne. Thank you and good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Over the past week, the COVID-19 pandemic in the Americas has intensified, affecting the lives of more people in more communities each and every day. In the region of the Americas, as of March 30th, there have been more than 163,000 confirmed cases and 2,836 people have lost their lives. Our region has entered a new phase with many countries reporting community transmission. The pandemic in the America is going to escalate and to get worse before it gets better. Just as we've seen happen in other regions around the globe. But despite the challenges ahead of us, there are reasons for hope. And it is that hope that we must encourage us to act now. I'd like to share a few with you today. First, we have faced threats before. The Pan American Health Organization has been working with the people and countries of the Americas to fight deadly diseases and to control outbreaks for almost 120 years. Our region has been polio free for 25 years. We were a leader in eradicating smallpox and we are making steady progress towards eliminating malaria. I believe we can stand up to COVID-19. Over the last 40 years, many of our member countries have developed health systems and a health workforce that is prepared to deal with serious challenges, even in a context of inequality and limited resources. The importance of strong and resilient health systems based on primary health care has never been more evident. Indeed, COVID-19 will put our health systems and services to the ultimate test. We are already hard at work with governments across the region to strengthen our public health response. All PAHO's country offices are supporting member states to plan, prepare, and respond to COVID-19, working around the clock 
with national health staff. Additionally, PAHO has scaled up capacity building to ensure that countries can quickly use the resources available to respond to this outbreak. Last week, we convened the national regulatory authorities to discuss how we could better leverage information and resources to ensure the safety and quality of medical products, especially tests. The second reason for hope is that we still have a window of time to act. There are steps that every country can take to slow the spread of the virus, to reduce the impact on its health systems, and to save lives. But only if we act now. What we do today will determine the capacity of our health systems to save lives tomorrow. Countries need to make domestic investments now to strengthen their health systems and services, building resilient health systems that have the capacity to detect, respond, and the search capacity to address the threat, while at the same time ensuring the provision of health services for all those that need them. I cannot emphasize enough that countries must take urgent action to prepare hospitals and health facilities for what is coming. An influx of COVID-19 patients that will need hospital space, beds, health professionals, and medical equipment. Governments at the national and local levels should organize health systems based on the assumption that their areas will be affected. This virus has not and will not be stopped by borders drawn on maps. Countries need to protect their health personnel as never before. They must be trained on how to avoid infection, have access to adequate supplies of protective equipment for the long haul, and it is also our duty to protect them and care for them as they will be on the front line of this battle. Countries need also to decide what social distancing measures that they need to implement and how and for how long. These include cancellation of mass gatherings, school and business closures, teleworking, and voluntary or legally mandated stay-at-home measures. Such measures might seem drastic, but they are the only way to prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed by too many sick people in too short a, a period of time. Measures should be implemented as soon as possible after a determination of the transmission scenario. Based on the experience of countries in the regions, other than the Americas, it seems prudent to plan for the implementation of measures for at least two to three months. Without solid evidence on effective treatments and no available vaccine at hand, social distancing and other aggressive preventive measures remain our best bet to prevent the most severe consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic in our region. This moment demands bold and compassionate leadership. It will not be easy, and we know we will be asking people to adapt to an extraordinary situ situation that is impacting everything in their lives. But let me emphasize this one more time. This pandemic is serious, and we need to do everything in our power to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on our peoples. And the best time to do this is now, before hospitals and health workers get overwhelmed. The third reason for hope and for action is that we have each other. Although many of us are spending time apart 
to protect ourselves and others, we are connected like never before. We share this challenge and we also will share the solutions. What happens in the coming weeks will highly depend on our joint efforts on working and acting together, even if physically apart. Solidarity in our region has never had deeper meaning than it does today. The only way out of this situation will be if anyone, everyone, like Pops Padden, does his or her part while supporting others. Countries must work together. Sharing resources, expertise, and making joint decisions that accelerate access to health services, promote research and innovation, and increase our ability to cope. PAHO will continue, as it always has, to help facilitate these exchanges between countries. We are guided by two pillars, the scientific evidence driving the global response to COVID-19 and the solidarity that has made us stronger over the past 120 years. We need to combine our solidarity with the best possible science to ensure that the actions we take are commensurate to the scale of this pandemic. It is science and solidarity that will empower all of us in the Americas to control the spread of COVID-19, care for those that get sick, and ultimately to save many lives. We will now have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. We will now move to take some questions, starting with those that we received via email, and then moving forward with those that we are receiving through the chat box. Please keep in mind that we will only have time to stay through till 12.30 today, and so we will take as many questions as possible until that time. Remember that you can ask your questions in Spanish or English as we have simultaneous translation. The first question is from a reporter from Bloomberg in Argentina. How do you compare the amount of testing for COVID-19 that has been done in Latin America with that of countries that have been more successful at curbing the pandemic? May I ask Dr. Barbosa to take a piece of this, please? Testing all suspect cases in their contacts is a very important measure to trace the spread of the virus and to take all the appropriate measures that are uh, recommended. PAHO, uh, we uh, have deployed so far more than 100,000 tests to the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, in many countries, such as Chile, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, that the, and others that have capacity, they, they have shared all the genetic information and we have many local production of these tests. Besides that, PAHO is also making, in a daily basis, contact with all the main producers of uh, rapid tests and uh, PR, PRC tests that can be used by the countries. So we are fully engaged to increase the capacity of the countries to have more access to tests and to the rational use of these tests to support the strategy that they have implemented in each country. Thank you, Dr. Robosa. The second question is from Jacqueline Charles from the Miami Herald. Can you discuss the challenges of contact tracing in the region? What are you running into? And have airline companies been cooperative in giving flight manifests? So, Dr. Ugarte, please. Thank you. Thank you for that question, that important question. Uh, first, the challenge is to identify the contact. And when the countries run tests to identify the confirmed cases, of course, they have also to uh, identify which are the contacts that if they become symptomatic, the tests that must be run. In most of the countries that have uh, successfully stopped the 
transmission was through those measures. We do have challenges though. As Dr. Barbosa mentioned, PAHO sent the countries approximately 200,000 reactions for tests. And they were distributed to the countries, particularly to those who cannot purchase or obtain those tests directly. In that regard, we are also identifying that many of the countries have the possibility to test the persons. And yes, we are uh, informing, the, we are receiving the information uh, to PAHO through the International Health Regulations Channel, through the national focal points, but also through the situation reports that each country is providing PAHO. And yes, the airlines and other transportation are providing us with a manifesto and they are implementing the uh, uh, provisions that are already in place by WHO and, and in the region as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ugarte. The next question is from Mariana Abru, the TV Ciudad. Hay algún avance in the is there any progress in the medication or vaccine to deal with the virus? What the evidence of interferon alpha 2b coming from Cuba that are being tested in China? Marcos Espinal, please. Eh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. And yes, there has been a lot of progress in the development of vaccines. In fact, there are several that are now already being tested as well as medications. There are clinical assays, uh, randomized assays that are already being used in several countries. Uh, there are antivirals and vaccines. Of course, we still don't have any evidence for approval, let's say, of any of the vaccines or medications that could be used in a massive manner. As to the interferon, it has been used in other countries as well in to curb this epidemic, but it has not been as a result of a clinical assay conducted regarding COVID. It has effects like other medications in uh, other diseases, but not specifically proven in COVID-19 yet. There's no uh, evident test that it actually works. Thank you, Dr. Espinal. This is from Diana Tinjaca from EFE, America Latina. Cuando se estima? When do you estimate that the region will reach the uh, contagion peak? Well, that is a <laughs> very interesting question. I wish I could find an answer to it, but according to measures taken by the countries or are being implemented by the countries of social distancing as well as uh, control and case identifications, it will all depend on the specific circumstances of each country. Some are already beginning to show that the disease control, it's reaching its limit. However, we're still seeing that the um, level could extend. And as for the very preliminary estimates, and we're talking about, uh, about a month or two, there's a second part of that same question from Dania Diana Tingha from FE. Some countries in the region have presumably put an end to the isolation or social distancing measures towards the middle of April. I, does PAHO consider this recommendable? And for how long do you think that these uh, quarantines should be extended? Well, yes. There are, in fact, some countries that have stated that mid-April they'll be suspending the social distancing measures. But as I said, it all depends on the risk evaluations each country carries out. But in particular, it depends on how the disease behaves elsewhere, where there would be more direct access to the country. I believe that countries like the United States or others in Latin America 
are extending that period beyond the end of April. And I believe that that is the measure that all countries should take into consideration to curb the transmission. Thank you. Next question from Sam Strangeways from the Royal Gazette from Bermuda. This is regarding testing. Do you have data on COVID-19 testing rates for countries in the Americas, including Bermuda and other Caribbean countries? Sylvain, may I ask you to take this, please? Dr. Alighieri. Thank you. Uh, during the last two months, uh, Pan American Health Organization has trained and equipped 29 countries uh, in the use of PCR, and all these countries have the capacity at this moment to test using their PCR machine network. We have provided them, it means their national networks for laboratory testing with about 200,000 tests. We are planning in the next three months for the existing laboratory networks to provide them with more than 900,000 reactions. This is a, an important aspect. The second important aspect is that many producers are now uh, proposing clinics and hospitals, and this would add a lot of options. Thank you, Dr. Alvi Jerry. Lazzarini, La Voz de Interior, Argentina. Quisiera saber. I'd like to know whether the reagents or the PCRs are sufficient throughout the world, and if they're scarce, would you recommend testing the whole population with symptoms, without symptoms, or only the critical cases? Dr. Ubarte. Actually, no, the tests are insufficient worldwide. And currently, there are the rapid tests that are being uh, distributed. And in some countries, these rapid tests have a different accuracy level. And they're being used as a triage. In other words, they're using those rapid tests, recognizing that they have a limited percentage of uh, effectiveness to actually find all positive cases, but mainly to recognize the negative cases. So in the absence of sufficient tests, is being given. mainly are in the health services being asked to uh, quarantine in uh, health centers preferably or at home but the appropriate isolation so that the people that present symptoms are unable to transmit it to others and of course as i said quarantine of all contacts from paulo adamo idiot the reporter from BBC World Services in Brazil. As for intensive care bed units, intensive care unit beds, how important are their availability in fighting the current pandemic? Do PAHO's member equipped ICUs? Thank you for these questions. Intensive care units, beds, and ventilators. Yes, let's think that the, all the social measure distances that the countries are implementing, the of uh, that that will be combined two strategies. The first. One Uh, distancing measures that can 
time to prepare the health services. The, the surgeries that uh, public and private sectors intensive care with the, the rate that the Brazil intensive care to European countries. So the problem is not only the, the, the number, but how they, they will be used and at the same time working to slow the transmission so the, the health services will not be overwhelming. Many countries also can implement uh, different strategies such using the primary health care to provide a proper triage and information uh, so mild cases can be uh, be man properly managed at, at the their uh, many tools and strategies that the countries need to, to put working together to reduce the, the possibility to have people looking for uh, intensive care unit beds and they are not available. Thank you. The last question for this moment will be from Maria Carmen Chinche from Del Diario de la República del Peru. What is the America have? No, a, a, but in light of the very as you said, reinforce the the existing laboratory network networks linked to the influenza surveillance system, expanding it with new machines and expanding the number of samples that can be processed daily or weekly. And the second axis, which is even more important to extend all this, is to use the new tools and the existing machines in the hospitals and clinics. These are machines that in most countries of the Americas have already been used in a dedicated manner to do uh, HIV and TB surveillance. These machines are in the hospitals already, and the um, manufacturers of these machines are now producing additional tools that can be incorporated to these machines to be used for this ca these cases. Thank you. Range of different questions that are on the same topic. Allow me to ask this one last question, Dr. Tian. Are the countries prepared to confront the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, in terms of supplies, personnel, infrastructure, and everything necessary to attend to patients? Well, thank you for this important, important question. Um, you will realize, however, that this region is a, a region that is not homogeneous. So the, the systems and services differ in many countries. We do have some countries uh, where health systems and services are weaker than in other countries. We, uh, we have widespread inequality. We have fragmented and segmented health systems where we have social security system, public health systems, and private health systems. I, I do believe that if we combined many of those in some countries, they would find that they, they do have um, significant capacity that the, the Ministry of Health um, needs to take in, into consideration. I, I believe there are challenges that are facing um, the region, certainly of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, there is a shortage of um, PPEs, the personal uh, protective equipment. and. Many of our countries, they, they do face that. We have distributed to all of our countries, but we need to be able to penetrate the market to, um, to be able to access more of those supplies. 
Um, as well, uh, our member states are using a variety of rapid testing. And um, that's why we had the meeting of the national regulatory authorities. We need to understand what is the capability and the quality of many of those tests um, that are being used. Um, the truth is, um, unless we ensure that social distancing is effective, some of our health systems and services will be overwhelmed. And that's why the social distancing is so important. I, I believe that in um, some of the countries that have had strong primary health care um, um, systems and services, we see the work um, of surveillance, of contact tracing, of detecting, of, of education on the ground. We see this having really very positive effects. And of course, we, however, will need the tertiary care um, services, hospitals with ICU beds. Um, countries have also been looking on as to how to expand the availability of those beds. And so there, there are other hospitals that are being brought into, um, into the, the fight so, and being equipped to um, be able to address um, the, 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 the response for particularly critically ill patients. So we see member states buying ventilators, accessing um, uh, ventilators from, from other countries so they could also boost that availability of, of ventilators. But I do believe with all of this that there are some countries that we will have um, some challenges and particularly in those countries it is extremely important in every country but particularly in these countries it is extremely important that we observe the social distancing uh, uh, methods that are being um, promoted in, in, in this region. I think importantly too this region has a high level of solidarity and we will see um, going forward how we will put this solidarity into action to ensure increased access for our member states to, uh, to the resources that we require, including PPEs and, and test kits and ventilators. Thank you. With this, I'd like to thank the members of the press that have uh, reached out to us and participated in this event. If you have additional questions, I encourage you to send them to media team at paho.org and we'll endeavor to respond to them in a timely fashion. As I mentioned earlier, the recording of this briefing will be available on our website and distributed by email. And as a reminder, Dr. Chen will be giving a media briefing on COVID-19 every Tuesday and we'll send out the corresponding invitations for this event. I want to thank members of the press again and my colleagues at PAHO, and I wish you all a good day. Thank you.